Good morning, everyone. Uh, as a reminder, the presentation portion of our session today will be recorded for potential future use in the museum's virtual programs. If you do not wish to appear in the recording, we ask that you please turn off your camera. And as a reminder, please mute yourself unless you have a question to ask or comment to make at the conclusion of the presentation. My name is Carla and I work at the Western Development Museum Moose Jaw as the Education and Public Programs Coordinator. Welcome to everyone joining us from all around the province and beyond. My coworker Dave is joining us remotely today from Saskatoon and will be helping to run the technical side of our presentation. He'll also be looking after the chat function. So should you have any questions or would like to share a memory or a comment, you can note it in the chat at the bottom of your screen and we'll circle back around to those at the conclusion. Also, if you're comfortable speaking, you can always unmute yourself at the end as well and you can make your comment that way. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the WDM Moose Jaw is located on Treaty 4 territory and the homeland of the Métis. This is the traditional territory of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakoda First Nations and the Métis people. The WDM is committed to working towards a new relationship anchored in the spirit of the treaties and to educating Saskatchewan people about their shared history of treaty making. The WDM has four locations, each with different artifacts and exhibits on display, as well as our corporate office in Saskatoon, which also serves as the collections warehouse for all of the artifacts that are not on display. Our Yorkton Museum tells the story of people through immigration and settlement in the last 100 years. The WDM North Battleford has an outdoor settler village and a working farm. The museum in Saskatoon is our largest and houses a 1910 boomtown right inside their building. Saskatoon also features exhibits on Indigenous history, including Métis cultural traditions and the signing of the treaties with the Crown. And Moose Jaw's theme, where I'm located here today, is the transportation history of our province. At the WDM, we love to hear and share stories about Saskatchewan. Our vision is a Saskatchewan where everyone belongs and histories matter. And at the end of our presentation today, we'd love to hear more about your experiences and stories. Now, I'd like to begin this part of the program by introducing our special guest speakers. Katie, Katie Hanna is our first, and she has worked as a curatorial associate at the WDM corporate office since 2018. She has a BA in history and archaeology mm -hmm. from McGill University and an MA in public history from Western University. Katie has worked at museums and heritage sites across Canada in various capacities, but finds the behind the scenes work in curation and collections management to be her greatest interest. Her research interests are in examining how modern day attitudes influence understandings of the past and how perceptions of history are always changing. As well, we're also joined by Ms. Carol Lafayette Boyd, the Executive Director of the Saskatchewan African Canadian Heritage Museum. Carol was born on a farm west of Saskatoon in 1942. She's lived in small towns until 1956. Carol and her siblings were the only Black children wherever they lived until 1959, when people of African ancestry began moving to Regina. Carol has been active with the following, the Saskatchewan African Canadian Heritage Museum, Bob Adams Foundation, and the For, Lo For the Love of Matthew Foundation. She attends Gateway Christian Fellowship Church. Carol has lived and worked in the United States and Canada as a clerk, nurse and social worker. Carol trained as a psychiatric nurse, a registered psychiatric nurse, and was a registered social worker. She retired in 2005 after 33 years with the Saskatchewan government in social services and corrections and public safety. She is a master's track and field athlete, having taken up competition at the age of 50. Carol is an inductee in the Regina Sports Hall of Fame 2014 and Canadian Masters Athletics Hall of Fame 2012. Carol was selected as the 2018 and 2022 World Masters Association Female Athlete of the Year. A huge welcome to our special guests and I'll pass the presentation portion of our program over to Katie. Hi everyone. Um... <laughs> Uh, are we, there we go, the video is switching over. 
Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Carla, for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to get us started right away. Um, I'm going to do the first part. Carol will do the second part of this presentation, and then we'll kind of come back together to do uh, questions or discussion afterwards. Um, so we can change our slide. Here. Oh, yeah. So that's um, just for um, reference. This is being co-presented with the Saskatchewan African Canadian Heritage Museum. And I highly recommend everyone check out their website. It's uh, really interesting. We have a link at the end to share it with you. Um, okay, so the railway across Canada was completed in 1885, and this connected east to west. Um, and it allowed settlers to really pour into Western Canada from the east. Um, and then once those settlers were here, and especially in the prairies farming, they were able to send their goods back, um, mostly east, sometimes west, um, to larger ports um, or larger centers uh, for use and consumption. Um, now, the trains themselves were very important for this. Um, and on the trains, we had lots of different types of jobs. Um, but the one we're going to focus on today is that of the porter. Um, so porters were responsible for sleeper cars. So you'd have um, specifically cars for sleeping in. Um, and the porters would do almost everything related to customer service in their car, with the exception of taking tickets, which was done by a conductor. So they, their tasks would include cleaning, making beds, stoking fires, shining shoes, giving local advice and information for all the towns they passed through. Um, uh, and waking passengers when they reached their stops. Um, they were expected to work 20 hours a day, four hours of sleep while you were on shift and otherwise you're on call all the time. Um, and the service was expected to be absolutely impeccable. Um, railways really prided themselves on the customer service they provided and there was no negotiation about that. You were, you were given good service. Um, so from the 1880s until around the 1960s, I haven't found a concrete date, um, porters were almost exclusively black men. Um, they were frequently overworked and under underpaid compared to their white coworkers. Um, and this worsened in 1908 when the white railway workers unionized and explicitly banned black employees from joining their union. So this um, further entrenched the inequalities and it made it um, much more appealing for the the railway companies to hire and maintain the status quo of having black porters. Um, in 1917, black railway workers were able to organize their own union and they created the Order of Sleeping Car Porters, the OSCP. Um, and I'll get more into that a little later on. Um, so cheap labor was very important to the people running the railway. Um, and when cheap labor could not be found in Canada, they looked abroad. Um, so especially after the white workers unionized, um, black workers being ununionized meant they could work longer hours for lower wages, um, which when you're trying to save or make a lot of money is very appealing to the railway companies. Um, but when black workers were hard to recruit in Canada, railways looked south to the United States and the Caribbean, um, especially the Southern United States, um, not so much the North. Um, because the recruiters relied on a lot of uh, stereotypes, um, inaccurate stereotypes, to find workers they believed would cause little trouble, few disturbances. Um, so for example, they targeted farmer, black farmers from the Southern United States because the recruiters assumed that having grown up in a segregated South, the workers would not object to the segregation that was present on the railways. Um, similar attitudes to the Caribbean, where you had lots of uh, Black men working on plantations. Um, there was a very strict social hierarchy that they wanted to kind of keep and maintain. Um, so when it comes to immigration, there's always two factors that people look at. So there's push factors, which is what inspires someone to want to leave where they currently live, and a pull factor, which is what makes them want to choose a specific place. So in this case, um, push factors for workers from the US and the Caribbean included low wages, extreme discrimination, um, and difficult working conditions. While the pull factors were promises of higher rate wages, reliable work, and less discrimination. 
Um, but these promises often did not prove to be true. Um, upon arriving in Canada, many of these workers realized that Canada was no better in terms of the way they were treated than where they had come from. And um, many workers, especially from the United States, wound up returning fairly quickly as they felt they were treated the same, but they could live in warmer climates um, down in the South and closer to family and friends and familiar places. Um, in 1897, the Canadian government passed the Alien Labor Act, which made it illegal to entice foreign workers to come to Canada. Um, but railway companies found many creative ways to kind of circumvent this law. Either they would find a creative little loophole. Um, they would, there was one case where they would pay men to come to Canada, but they would tell them it wasn't an incentive. It was just a gift. And then they would come and they would work for the railways and um, they, they would find lots of ways around it. Um, but they would also just outright ignore the law and they would rather pay the fines for violating the act. It turned out to be cheaper than hiring local labor often. Um, but it was a bit frustrating to always have to be paying fines or looking for loopholes. So the railway executives really wanted to find a permanent solution um, around the Alien Labor Act. Um, they decided that Canada should bring a Caribbean nation into confederation um, as a province of Canada, so that they could bring in unlimited workers from whichever nation they brought into confederation, um, as it wouldn't be immigration anymore, it would be migration within Canada. Um, they considered a lot of places, including Jamaica, Jamaica Barbados, Bermuda, and the Bahamas. Um, but when the general public heard about this idea, they were not fond of it. Um, they were especially worried about the huge influx of Black people who could vote in Canada. Um, they were worried about lessening their own voting power and the giving a voice to uh, minorities who they did not want to have a voice. Um, those in support of bringing a Caribbean country into Confederation really tried to reassure the public um, that they would find ways to prevent these new Canadians from voting, but the fears persisted and ultimately um, a Caribbean province never came to be, as we all know. Um, the First World War further increased the need to import labor from other places, um, with many white men shipping off to fight overseas. Um, they needed to be replaced on the railways. Uh, there were a lot of barriers preventing Black men from enlisting in the military, which made them easier to keep on as employees. And again, they're up until 1917, they're not unionized, they're getting paid significantly lower wages. Um, so during the war, the railway companies also became much bolder in their attempt, their dismissal of the Alien Labor Act. Um, because the need for workers had increased everywhere, the officials responsible for enforcing the Alien Labor Act were often focused elsewhere. They didn't have the time or the resources to go after the railway companies for this. Um, to put this in context, the number of people they brought in, between 1916 and 1919, Canadian Pacific Railway alone, just one railway company, brought in over 500 men, Black men, to Canada, just to work as porters. Um, so this was quite a big thing. Um, so labor organization is a very prominent theme through the history of the porters. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in 1917, the railway workers created the first Black railway union in North America, um, which was the Order of Sleeping Car Porters, OSCP. Um, they formed under the leadership of a man named John A. Robinson, who was a porter from St. Kitts. Um, the union fought against the segregation of railway workers, and they drew attention to the discrimination faced by their workers. Um, the railways had intentionally fueled tensions between their Black and white workers. They worked to make sure each group blamed the other, rather than blaming the railway companies for real or perceived issues in their working conditions. Um, they would tell the white workers, these black workers are scabs, they're, you know, undercutting the union, they're lowering your potential earnings, and they would tell the black workers, look, they've, these white workers have excluded you from your, uh, from their union, they don't care about you, and they just really wanted to keep the focus off themselves. Um, so, but the uh, order of sleeping car porters wasn't just for uh, advocating for better working conditions for sleeping car porters. They also became a mouthpiece for the broader African-Canadian community. 
um, advocating better for better working conditions and living conditions for all people of African descent in Canada. Um, so that's kind of the background to this. I'm going to pass this off to Carol now, who will kind of tie this back to Saskatchewan specifically, and then even more personal stories. Okay, thank you, Katie, and thank you everyone for coming here. I, I see the photo up there. That's from a, a I guess that's a is that a 1930 should be a picture. I think it is um, the the, uh, the uh, 1910 Rough Riders team photo with uh, Stonewall Jackson. I think that's really 1930. I think you're right. Yeah, I think that yeah. was a typo in my and, heart. Uh, so he's it there in the back. You can see him. He's wearing. He's not wearing uh, out. Uh, football outfit and we think that's because he was being the porter on as they rode the train to their their games and uh that's why he was that way but he uh we we've recognized him as uh, one of the first people that were involved with the a person of anc a black ancestry african ancestry being involved with the rough riders but I'm really here more to talk about probably my family, because my uncle Bob, who was uh, born in the United States in uh, 1892, I think it was, or in 1894, and he came to Canada in 1910 with uh, the groups of people that came from Oklahoma. And in 1916, he signed up to uh, join the number two battalion, which was an all black uh, team or all black regiment that uh, came from the United States, Canada and the Barbados. And the interesting thing about them was that there were over 750 of them. They couldn't get into the army the, the regular way because blacks weren't wanted, but it was discovered that they were needed. So they got this group together to, and sent them overseas without any guns to chop down trees, build a railroad, and maintain the railroad in France there. But when they came back, not like their European descendant um, counterparts, they were not given any benefits. And the nice thing that happened last year was the government of Canada recognized that, that the error that had been made and uh, gave an apology to the descendants of the people. So I was kind of one of the descendants because he was my great uncle, but he went on to be a porter. And uh, he, I never really understood much about him, about what he was doing. But as, as you grow up now, you do see the, the things that they've gone through. Because my brother, when, um, when he turned 16, we were attending, I guess it was kind of a one room schoolhouse in uh, a small town. And uh, his teacher was really quite mean. And she said to him on his 16th birthday on June 7th, she said, Arnold, why are you here? You're, you're not doing anything. You, you shouldn't be here. He got up and walked out, I understand. I don't remember that. But he went on to join the, the railroad. He started out as, as a red cap. And they often traveled to... Uh, across across Canada and I'm not sure like he seemed to travel a lot to Winnipeg and Calgary and did end up living in Calgary so uh that that's an interesting part but I should go back to to Stonewall Jackson because I guess on the way to the 1930 Great Cup Championships in Toronto the team traveled on the Canadian National Railway and Jackson worked on the train at, rather than take time off and he appears in that photo there that you saw just wearing a tie. And I guess that's because he was working rather. Now this picture, yeah, you can go ahead to the next picture uh, of uh, my brother, Arnold and his wife, Claire. The interesting thing about Arnold's story is that he ended up in Montreal as a porter or I'm not sure, I, I never did understand what all he did on the railroad. But when he ended up in Montreal, he met this woman, Claire, and the interesting thing is she was also from Rosetown and we never knew her when we lived in Rosetown. She knew about us as we were the only black family there. And uh, they met up in, in Montreal and uh, fortunately they did to return home here. So about Arnold for the first few years of his career, uh, the black people were limited as porters or red caps. 
And Arnold explained that there was no written policy at the time preventing them from applying for other jobs with the railway, but they never would never be offered other jobs, no matter how qualified they were. And, and that's because of the color of our skin. One of the most significant moments in terms of career advancement for Arnold, we, he recalled it in the 1950s when Prime Minister John Diefenbaker would regularly ride the train from Prince Albert to Ottawa via Saskatoon. And that's where Arnold had signed up was in Saskatoon because it was um, less than 100 miles from our, our farm where we grew up. And Diefenbaker would often chat with the workers on the train. And at one point he observed that all the porters and red caps were black, but the black men were never in any other position. And when he asked a porter why this was, the porter explained that they would apply for all sorts of other jobs, but would be never offered these positions. And what Diefen Baker did, he told the porters he would look into things and change them so that they could work wherever they liked. And of course, the porters didn't think much of that promise, mostly assuming it was an empty political promise. But Diefen Baker did intervene and um, put, uh, and things did soon change. The black men were suddenly able to apply for any jobs they were qualified and receive job offers. So Arnold was able to go from being as a working as a porter work, to working out of Winnipeg in a dining car where the pay was better. He later worked as a dining car steward and then a sleeping car conductor. And uh, he has some really fun stories to tell about uh, working in the dining car. But he, cre he credits Diefenbaker with making the changes necessary to allow black men to advance in their careers. And uh, finding information on this topic from Diefenbaker's perspective has been proven difficult because the Diefenbaker archives that are held in the U University of Saskatchewan archives and special collections has a lot of documents relating to the railway labor issues, but finding anything about this specific topic has been difficult. So more research is needed. So about Arnold, because he was born and raised on a farm near Rosetown, and our family had come to, to Regina from Iowa in 1906, and that's my father's side, and my mom's family had come from Oklahoma in 1910. That, that was the whole group that had gone up to the Maidstone area. However, my great-grandmother, who came in 1910 from Oklahoma, it shows at the border crossings that she was going to go to North Battleford or, or Maidstone, but however, ended up in the Amber Valley settlement. That's with the black settlement in Alberta. And uh, that's where a lot of my relatives, like they were, I, my dad had nine siblings and the majority of them found a spouse from the Amber Valley descendants. Uh, and by 1911, my grandfather had homesteaded just at an area west of Rosetown, he left Regina. And they had come here really to escape the legacy of, of discrimination that they faced. But there and on the farm, there was a school built on my grandfather's land and um, they called it Oskaloosa. It was named after the town where they came from. And what's interesting, there's that school, there's a picture of it. There's my aunts and, and uncles there. You can see it was an integrated school. But that one room schoolhouse, I attended that school in 1947. And an interesting story there, because I, I just love this story, because it's about Arnold. We, uh, by the time I got there, there were only five of us kids in 1947 in that school. There were no other children in the farming area going to the school. But those five children were my two older brothers and my two older sisters and myself. And on that last day, it was my last day, the older ones had to write exams, but I didn't, I was, I just started school. And my younger brother and I had walked to school because I th thought it was miles, but apparently it was only about a mile, mile and a half. We'd walked to school. And when we had been in the schoolyard, we saw our dad coming with the three older ones. We left the, the schoolyard to meet them. And the teacher said that we would have to write lines for leaving the schoolyard. And I well. Yeah. That wasn't nice, but my sister Vera thought that was really funny and giggled all about it. So she was going to have to stay after school and write lines because she was giggling. So when at noon hour, the backstop of, we would play softball, but the backstop had a hole in it. So my older brother Arnold and Vera went and got the, the gate and put that at the back so we wouldn't have to chase the ball. The teacher then told Arnold and Vera they would have to stay after school and write lines that they wouldn't uh, remove the fence again. So at the last recess, 
my brother Arnold, he, he, was, he was a bit of a troublemaker, possibly, whatever you want to call it, because he made us play hooky and all kinds of things. But he said, OK, that's it. We're not we're, nobody's writing lines at, at 3.30 when the teacher rings the bell. And our sister Isabel, who we call Miss Goody Two Shoes, she had no lines to write. We, Arnold said to her, when the teacher rings the bell, because you had that bell that rang, when she, she rings the bell, you, when you get up, we're all getting up and we're walking out. And for me, he said, you don't have to worry because you don't have to go back. There's nothing that can happen to you. So at 3.30, the bell rang. And what does Miss Goody Two Shoes do? She sat there. We ended up having to write lines. But I, when I think about it, I think the teacher wanted to keep us there just a little bit longer because that was going to be the last year that that school was closed. So that's one of my stories about Arnold. He was a, he was a bit of a troublemaker with the schools. So um, that, that's our school. Then what happened with Arnold was, as I started, I told you before that on that day, on his 16th birthday, the, the teacher told me, he asked him what he was doing there. And our mom had known a woman in Saskatoon who ran a boarding house for the porters and red caps. And so that's how Arnold got his job connected with her. And he worked as a, a red cap. He um, rode the trains and traveled across the country. The red cap stayed in one city and helped passengers load and unload their luggage for the train and help passengers to get to their cars or taxis. Now the uniforms for porters and red caps were almost identical, except for the porters wore gray caps and the red caps wore, wore red ones, and that hence the name. And uh, Arnold uh, met with a woman who ran the boarding house and she assured him she could get him a job as a red cap. And so he worked for two years as a red cap in Saskatoon. He made good money for the time and wages and, and made additional money and tips from passengers. The, the salary for a red cap was about $200 per week but red caps could double their wages through tips. And now I know why Arnold came home one, would always come home with, with gifts for us. And I, I'll never forget him bringing home the, uh, uh, what I guess it was a 78 record. And uh, we, uh, before that, we just listened to the cowboy singers, the Western singers, and he brought, brought home, I'll never forget, a Ray Charles record. From that day on, I was a Red um, a Ray Charles fan. I even got to meet him. That, that's an, that's another story. But um, so after two years working as a Red Cap, Arnold wanted to travel and see the rest of the country, and he took a job as a porter. And at that time, porters were not based out of Saskatoon, only Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Winnipeg, Montreal, and Toronto, and maybe a couple of other cities. Uh, the boarding houses in Saskatoon that housed porter the house supporters were mostly for those who were passing through town. And in the towns that porters were based out of, they had social clubs for the porters and that were very common. They'd have dances, games and drinking. And as of 2018, there were still a handful of these clubs existing in Canada. And after working years on the railroad and living in Calgary and Montreal, Arnold cashed in his pension and moved home here to Regina with his wife, where they still are today. And uh, we still have reunions out there near Rosetown. Well, we haven't had one for almost eight years, I think. And that's that picture there is at our school, our one-room schoolhouse at Oskaloosa in 1970 when we had our first reunion. There were 99 of us, but the most of the people in that, a lot of people in that picture are the, the neighbors. The neighbors always came out. Um, once Lafayette had settled there, the neighbors, we were just part of the, the community. So I'm going to let Katie conclude our discussion about porters. And if you have any questions about uh, our, our black porters, I'll be glad to answer those. So back to you, Katie. Thank you, Carol, for uh, sharing your stories. Um, I always love hearing about that stuff. Um, so just to wrap things up, um, the role of porters is something that's really been overlooked um, in people studying history of Canada, especially until fairly recently. Uh, but in the past 13 years, I'm thinking about the book that I use a lot for this research, published in 2010. In the past 10 to 15 years, I'd say, um, there's been quite a surge of interest in the topic. There have been multiple books published. Um, quite a few museums have developed exhibits, including the WDM. We're working on adding some 
um, exhibit signage to all four of our museums on the topic of porters. Um, and last year, the CBC premiered a TV show about porters called The Porter, um, which I hear good things about. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Uh, not for children. That's, I'm pretty sure it is not rated for children based on the trailers I've seen. Um, anyway, so porters were an essential part of the railway industry in Canada. Um, they worked a difficult job. As I mentioned earlier, they were only permitted four hours of sleep a night and were otherwise expected to be ready to work at any moment. Um, but for the time, the pay was good. And I know um, when I spoke with Arnold last year, he looked back on his time with the railways quite fondly. Um, and today there are still railway porters. It's still a job that exists, uh, but it's now open to anyone of any background. Um, so that's kind of all I have to say for the end of this. Next, uh, WDM Virtual Coffee Club, which will be 10 o'clock a.m. on Tuesday, March the 21st. And our presenter will be Meredith. And Meredith gave our last month's uh, presentation about winter travel. She works up in the Saskatoon location. And our topic is Violet Saskatchewan. And if you maybe have heard that name, but you're not sure what, who, what, who she was, um, Violet McNaughton's name is not very well known in Canadian history. However, the work that she did to advance gender equality for settler women in Saskatchewan left a legacy that's still felt today. We'll learn about Violet's story and that of other Saskatchewan women, women, particularly rural settler women in the early 1900s, and International Women's Day is in the month of March, so we thought this was a, a nice little tie-in to that one. So I hope you'll be able to join us for next month, and again, as always, if you've enjoyed today's presentation, we encourage you to share with your friends, tell them about the program. <laughs>